Welcome to our weekly panel discussion here at the Iowa City Public Library. Before we begin, a few thank yous. First to Susan Craig and her staff here at the Public Library who make this space available to us every Friday at noon. Then to Downing Thomas and International Programs at the University of Iowa who provide the pizza and drinks in the back of the room. And finally, a special thanks to Jill Staggs from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the U.S. State Department, which provides the lion's share of funding for the International Writing Program. Uh, IWP.uiowa.edu is where you can find uh, biographies of the writers who appear here each week, samples of their writings, and the full schedule. You'll see on your uh, seats that there are index cards and pencils. We ask you to write out your questions. We'll collect them at the end of the presentations and then pass them along to our writers. The title of our panel discussion this week is Should a Writer Speak for the Universal? Last week on September 6th, writers from the International Writing Program lent their voices to Berlin's main literary festival's annual worldwide reading, this time in support of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris on December 10, 1948. Eleanor Roosevelt chaired the commission established to draw up the 30 articles delineating the fundamental freedoms enshrined in the United Nations Charter. A PDF of the declaration is available on the UN's website. And these form the basis for the promotion of human rights around the world, including the right to life and rights to freedom of movement, association, thought, conscience, and religion. Which leads us to ask, how can writers and cultural institutions best claim space for and remain vigilant on issues of human rights? And should they? Or should they instead support more local, specific, culturally set priorities? How attached are you to the idea of universal values? We've assembled a wonderfully distinguished group of writers for this panel, and they are in order of their presentations. Uh, Panashi Chigomatsi, who comes to us from South Africa in Zimbabwe. She's the author of the novel Sweet Medicine, which won the 2016 K. Sello Duiker Literary Award. A short story, Small Deaths, was nominated for the 2016 Pushcart Literary Prize. She's the founding editor of Vanguard Magazine, a platform for black women in post-apartheid South Africa. And in 2016, she curated Soweto's Ubuntu Book Festival for black readers and writers in the country's largest township. Sitting next to her is Hajar Bali from Algeria. Until 2016, she was a professor of mathematics at the University of Sciences and Technologies in Algiers. Her collection of plays, Dream and Bird Flight, appeared in 2010, a collection of stories, Too Late, in 2014, she has held writing residencies in France and Switzerland and is now the general secretary of the Limago Cultural Association in Algiers. Next to Hajar is Wipas Srithang from Thailand. He's published three novels, many short stories and collections of English language and concrete poetry. His debut novel, The Dwarf, won the 2012 SEA Write Award for Novels. His subsequent two novels were long and shortlisted for it as well, and his stories have won prizes from Penn Thailand. Next to Wipas is Julianne Van Loon from Australia. She's a research fellow at the nonfictional.ab of RMIT University in Melbourne, our fellow UNESCO City of Literature. She won the Australian Vogels Award and in 2005 was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize First Book Award for Road Story. Her work, including the recent novel Harmless, has strong creative and cultural connection in Asia, particularly China, and her forthcoming collection, The Thinking Woman, includes interviews with leading women from across the globe. And sitting next to her is nobody, but... <laughs> Uh, and we do hope that 
Aki Madasari from Indonesia will make it in time, though it does not look like it, that her flight is delayed. And if she does not arrive, then uh, uh, John Vader from our translation program will uh, kindly read the presentation that she's put together. Aki is the founder and director of the ASEAN Literary Festival in 2012. Her novel, The Outcast, about an Islamic sect facing persecution by mainstream religion, received the Katalisawia Literary Award. The Years of the Voiceless is about the struggle for justice and freedom while questioning the authority of religion. And 86 from 2011 addresses corruption in Indonesia. We hope she will make it, but if she doesn't, John will ably fill in. And now we'll begin with Tanashi. Thank you very much. Um, I would just like to start my, um, uh, my contribution to the panel um, by acknowledging um, some people who are in the room and aren't in the room. Um, one of them is here. Um, that is uh, Brooke Kimbrough. Um, and the other person is Lisa Covington. And the third one is Tamika um, Conley-Smith, who have been really um, big sources of encouragement, and particularly when I think I accidentally ended up on this panel because I think I didn't read the blurb properly. Uh -huh. And then I realized, oh, I don't think I actually have anything to say about this. Um, and um, they provided the provocation sort of around sort of why it is that I felt that I had nothing to say about um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And just to give context, Universal Declaration of Human Rights as um, Chris has mentioned comes in 1948, which is three years after the end of um, the world, Second World War, which I would characterize as one as sort of the first major crisis of Western civilization or the crisis of imagination that the world suffers. Um, and so that's sort of how I contextualize the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and something you should keep in mind as, as I read. <clears throat> I have nothing to say. Fellow other, Audrey Chin, my fellow IWP writer, where she put your hand up, there she is, uh, gives me words for my nothing to say in her prose poem, We Are Who Freaks Us, Thusly. A roiling in the heart, a tight, tight something in the abdomen, an ache in the lower back, fire trying to get out. Can I? Should I speak about universal human rights? I struggle with this topic until I realize there's nothing to say. For what is there to say about human rights for those of us, others, who have been historically thingified into subhumans? What is there to say about those of us who don't quite fit in the universe, universe of, to quote Sylvia Winter, normal humanness? Nothing unless we're willing to go back 500 years or so in Western-centric modernity, which has structured the modern world and universality according to oppositional relationships such as subject, object, human, animal, rational, irrational, free, enslaved, normative, other. If this is too abstract, let me try and make it concrete, right here, right now. What can be said about an orange turd who grabs pussies, hates African Americans, repeatedly attempts to ban Muslims, proposes to build walls between itself and Mexico, and cannot bear to shake the hand of a woman president? Or his European counterparts who inaugurated the Brexit moment? Not much. Though I'm sure much can be said by those who are surprised at the reemergence of the right wing in the West, or surprised that the so-called progress of Western humanity and development has brought us here. For those of us who are unsurprised, we have long recognized what Professor Cornell West calls the dark side of, human, of modernity, the underbelly of enlightenment. We recognize the, the neglect of an inconvenient truth that the progress of the modern world has been underwritten by anti-black institutions of genocide, slavery, colonialism, apartheid, and neocolonialism. As such, we might appreciate Susan Sontag's 1976 sentiment that, if America is the culmination of Western white civilization, there must be something terribly wrong with Western white civilization. Or, as Franz Fanon nuances in The Wretched of the Earth, two centuries ago, a former European colony decided to catch up with Europe. It succeeded so well that the United States of America became a monster, in which the taints, the sicknesses, and the inhumanity of Europe have grown to appalling dimensions. If the West could reimagine a humanity not dependent on dehumanization, perhaps then I'd have more to say. 
I'd speak of how Bantu language speakers in Southern Africa conceptualize humanity and personhood, not according to Descartes, I think, therefore I am, but rather through the philosophy of Ubuntu, which is contained in the Zulu language aphorism, Ubuntu ngumuntu ngabantu, meaning we are, therefore I am. In African ph philosophy through Ubuntu, Mahobe Ramos elaborates, to be a human being is to affirm one's humanity by recognizing the humanity of others, and on that basis, establish humane relationships with them. This has critical implications. As Calvin Warren puts it in Black Nihilism and the Politics of Hope, Western philosophy constructed the rational subject against the non-reasoning Black, who, according to Hegel, Kant, Hume, and even Nietzsche, was situated outside of history, moral law, and consciousness, such that thinking itself is structured by anti-blackness from the very start. From here, to, we, see, we come to see that racism, and specifically anti-black racism, as an organizing concept is related to a debate or contest concerning the quality and the universality of humanness, which racists doubt and anti-racists assert. In other words, racism is best understood as the systematic doubt of the humanity of certain people. By systematic, we mean the corralling of social, economic, and cultural institutions to enforce the subhuman or less human than others status of certain people globally. Where on one hand, conservative thought has outright rejected the possibility of the humanity of the other, on the other hand, liberal humanism has asserted that the other can theoretically acquire human status through assimilation into European culture and quote unquote civilization. Here we come full circle. For some, the civilizational crisis following the wave of the Trexit moment has been a surprise. For those of us others, however, who have borne the brunt of the dehumanization that is not incidental, but rather integral to its rise and maintenance, we find ourselves without much to say. And so I might have more to say about universal human rights if we were willing to consider the violences subsumed within it. Until then, if I do speak, if I do say something, the fire might just get out. And I'm not quite sure. No, I know the world as we know it would not survive this fire this time. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, do you hear me? Uh, I, I want to thank John for the work that he has done. It was really, with me especially, very difficult, I think. So uh, I have a friend, a writer, an Algerian friend, who, who always um, writes, he's also a journalist, about, about the other writers. And he's very... Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, so um, everyone is afraid of him because when he writes something, we are, we are all uh, uh, trying to, to know what, what about uh, he, he is writing. And never he wrote about me. One day I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I met him and asked him, but uh, you, don't, you didn't write again, uh, yet uh, about me. He said, oh, I'll do it one day. I will write about your schizophrenia. You're called uh, Hajar, or Jalila, or Majda, what does it mean, all these names? Uh, of course, I have uh, some reasons to have uh, uh, a pen name, which is Hajar, and uh, my, uh, my name is Jalila, that I don't, I don't want to, to speak about because it will be so long, but here, when, uh, when preparing this uh, panel, I... I, I found another reason that I want to talk to you about it. So, reflecting on uh, human rights, or subjects related to the rights of everyone, whether in the universal or local sense, is, for me, inseparable from the question of citizenship. As writers, whether we like it or not, we occupy a, a space of influence in our respective societies since we, since we have the ability to read and write, which is not uh, 
uh, automatic in every country. And above all, to, to think and reflect. We must share our, our knowledge for me. We must contribute to a discourse or participate in a global cause. Reading and writing inspires rationality, helping us to think beyond our immediate environment. Thanks to this, our profession, even if I don't like this word, but I don't know if we, are, if we have a profession as writers, our profession helps us become more worldwide. And by the world, I mean the many sufferings we observe all around us. The, now, the knowledge that the lives of others elsewhere or close to us are in disarray. We know this because our profession makes us aware of the fact that, as we say in French, uh, nous sommes ce que nous sommes, mais nous pouvons aussi être autre chose. As such, we have duties. In an, in an interview with Bourdieu, the writer Gunther Grass said, we have to open our mouths. And in French, it was, uh, nous, dev, nous devons ouvrir nos gueules. And gueule is not really, uh, meaning we must participate in rebuilding the world and ourselves together. How? Today, the world asks us to have opinions on everything. I think that, as writers, there's no need for us to open our mouths with speeches. More importantly, it seems to me, is being informed. And especially to be able to detect the ingredients of that receipt the politicians and economists of the world use to souse and eat people. <laughs> this means that we must possess the ability, I think we possess the ability to decipher the diagrams and figures the experts align before our tired eyes and understand how the mechanisms of power operate so as to deconstruct them and comfort reality without looking away, without lowering our eyes. Uh, this is something that me, as a person, I could militate for. I mean, a field in which Jalila would willingly engage. But Haja is something else. <laughs> Maybe that's why I use a pseudonym, dividing who I am as a citizen and who I am as a writer. Haja is the one who tries to write literature. Literature, to my mind, is something different. When I try to write, I have to shut out the slogans, speech, and sound bites that bombard us, us daily, which is not an easy task. I explore the complex universes that we are. This is uh, universal for me. When I write, I claim total freedom, irresponsibility. I probe the unconscious. The unconscious. <laughs> I, like said one of my uh, characters in, uh, in a short novel, I search the dumpsters of the world, seeking the irreverent and the sublime. I can be an angel or scoundrel, and often both at once. To dig and to dig, to search, to extract the rarest pair by which I mean the most translucent, wildest thought, the one not spoken through borrowed words, the one that mixes the times, the epochs, the strata, the layers, and diabolic, and real, and imaginary. That which paradoxically circulates in us all. It is in the quest that the, the, the marvelous writers uh, like Marcus, uh, Kafka, Faulkner, Cervantes, Rushdie, and so on, so, so many others, uh, we love, have attained university, uh, universality for me. Will I ever get there? The path is long, I know. Concerning freedom, uh, freedom Camus wrote, it is a long and solitary race and very exhausting. No champagne or friends wait to raise their glasses or to look upon you with kindness. 
left alone in a morose room, alone in the box, to decide before the judges, before oneself, the judgment of others. All freedom ends with a sentence, which is why, which is why liberty is too heavy to bear, especially when one suffers from, pe from fever or pain or likes no one. <laughs> this could, could very f well define the task of the writer. So yes, the path is long. But I reassure myself by thinking, as one character says in my novel that I'm writing, he says that the pretext is often more exciting than the goal. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Vipat Sitong from Thailand. I'm going to read a paper. It's called The Tongue. It's about my country, which is quite messy now. Um, the Tongue. In my country, there is little respect for human rights. So for me, the concept of universal values is imperative. Since the military launched a coup and established a dictatorship in 2014, Many Thai writers have given up criticizing the growing hostility of the junta toward human rights. Not only has the threat of punishment for dissent and the increase of censorship discouraged them, but with time, enthusiasm has also waned. I formed a group with other writers to protest the junta, but the movement dissolved. Fatigue and futility exhausted us. It's not what we became political inert. Some began to support identity politics and LGBT rights. But this was set apart, secretly decided by the junta. It helped them project Thailand as a modern progressive nation, while it con continued to disemble freedom of speech, democratic processes, and the protection of civil liberties. The military middle and upper class disaffect with the elected government and the tradition are at the core of this police state. Tradition is a part of progress, and progress is built on collective achievement over time. But Thai tradition, in my view, favor hierarchy, hierarchy and centralization over meaningful reform. It has become a solid mass and composite, and lost its malleability. It confines us, a culture that has paved the way for our current political crossroads need to be undermined, and value perpetuating inequality destroyed. Preserving tradition has become shorthand for an ideology through which the junta is st steadily sabotaging democracy, justice, and the independent media. There is no room for criticism or difference in opinion. As seen in Thai fiction today, only the mad and the gods get away with speaking taboo truths. Life has returned to normal after the upheaval, but, the, but this normalcy bothers me. Surrounded by those who support the coup, I have turned to fiction to guide my walk in the darkness. This book speaks the truth to me. It seems fiction is the best way to reach the understanding of the truth, in the way that we understand ourselves, not through the accumulation of facts, but through memory and our own narrative. I have realized amid the deluge of report, reports since the day that we need writers of literary fiction to explain what happened and uncover the hidden truth. This is why, in the last decade, I have started writing about what is happening in my country. When I was a kid, I lived in a small town in southern Thailand. One evening, while coming home with my friends from the park by the river, we decided to play a game. To play a game, we raced home, and agreed whoever came in last would be deemed caught by the river ghost. But I didn't hear the starting call, and fell behind as the others disappeared around the freckling street light on the corner. I chased after them in the semi darkness, in the semi -dark darkness, but stumbled, and my knees slammed into the concrete. It was so painful that I squeezed my eyes shut to withhold my, cr my cry. My body tensed and I crunched my lips. But in the end, my cry came, everything released. 
My body shook and rolled on the ground. My scream burned my face. Every part of me became a tongue, writhing to describe the pain and twisting to explore the intensity of the agony. The world became a cruel, horrifying abstract. My face left me on the dark and empty road, alone and with nobody to hear me. Back to 2010, after the coup displaced the elected government, the United Front for Democracy Against Dictatorship, aka UDD, aka Red Shirt uh, People, protest the interference of the military and others in a democratic process and call for the fresh elections. The military cracked down against these protests, left at least 95 dead and hundreds injured. In my novel, I describe the jubilant public cleanup of the protest site that occurred just days later, and which was only uh, 15 minutes from my house. At this time, the scream of the people being shot and the wails of the boy returned to me. The cry of pain is universal. I try to write knowing how lowly and painful it is when a voice has no audience and disappears into silence. Thank you, Vipas. It's a, a hard uh, couple of sentences to follow. It's uh, very thought-provoking. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Should a writer speak for the universal? The above is a troublesome question. Writers are not a homogenous group and should do as they like for their own purposes and on their own terms. At the same time, all of us need to be careful about making claims to do with speaking for on behalf or on behalf of others. What about speaking for myself? I'm a writer of fiction. Should I set out to speak for the universal? The answer, for me at least, is no. I would never do so. I would not presume to have the capacity to write this way, but further doubt its achievability. Importantly too, universality isn't the well from which my writing springs. My writing springs from particularity, particular troubles, life experiences, concerns arising from particular times. Mary Oliver wrote, one tree is like another, but not too much. One tulip is like the next tulip, but not altogether. More or less like people, a general outline than the stunning individual strokes. This sentiment aligns with my experience as both a reader and a writer. Outstanding writers of fiction have exceptional skills with language, storytelling and the imagination. Often they exhibit an extraordinary capacity for empathy too, enabling them to trespass into the imagined worlds of others. A good fiction writer shows something of what it means to live in a specific time and place and to be of a certain culture or subculture. Even when they are seeking to represent space, times or cultures they, that may not literally exist, their work is imbued with particular ways of knowing, including the limitations of that knowing. Good literature can illuminate complexity and help readers arrive at a question or a set of questions without being required to form solutions. Literature allows us to sit with the trouble and contradiction and to contemplate these in a way we may not otherwise experience. The capacity, uh, sorry, this capacity places literature in a particular relation to notions of truth or universality. A reader can draw conclusions from literature, but those are their conclusions, and that is a very different thing from saying a writer should or could speak for or on behalf of the universal. What do we take to mean the universal anyway? Claims to universality will always have a presumption about them that we should treat with suspicion. If universality means an idea or experience understood as being the same across the universe, well, we need to ask, for whom? Not so long ago, textbooks spoke of universal man, for example, excluding those humans gendered female. What about radically different worldviews or worldviews we can only imagine? What about the values of the non-human, plants, animals, other forms of life? 
What do we humans know about the universe anyway? We cannot even agree on its edges. The Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights is a tremendously important document, perhaps one of the most important of the last century. It holds governments to account. But consider that when looked at closely, even this document assumes shared cultural understandings. It is a product of a particular group, the United Nations General Assembly in Paris in 1948, and is inflected with that group's perspective. Consider Article 17. Everyone has the right to own property alone, as well as in association with others. Actually, I would argue this right is problematic as it allows the global capitalist system to exploit the powerless. How might writers claim space for and remain vigilant on issues of human rights? By writing literature inspired by what moves, preoccupies and disturbs our particular hearts. How attached am I to universal values? I'm attached to living a good life and helping others to do the same. I think the generative aspect of my writing is informed by this attachment, but importantly, it's not ruled by it. What is a good life? The answer can never be summarily declared. I'm for an imaginative writing capable of letting go, at least to some extent, of the very ideas of good and bad. It is writing as a kind of experiment glimpsed by Rumi when he wrote, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. Hi, everyone. I'm John. Um, yeah, Oki's flight got delayed, uh, so I'll be standing in for her. Um, thank you. Stories of humanity, stories for the universe. So what does fiction mean? This question returned to haunt me when someone asked me to write an introduction for a book based on the Ahmadi people who have been living at a refugee shelter in Lombok for the past 10 years now. Yes, it's been 11 years since hundreds of Ahmadi, a persecuted Islamic minority, were thrown out of their homes and forced to live at a government building in Mataram, Lombok, West Nusa Tenggara province. And it has been four years since the publication of my third novel, Mariam, The Outcast, which tells of their fate. The novel won the Katulistiwa Literary Award later in the year and has since been read and discussed in Indonesia and abroad. And yet, it's failed to create changes in the conditions of these people. These same people are still living as refugees while their land and homes have been left empty and neglected, slowly destroyed by rain and heat as time goes by. These people have lost their rights as citizens and human beings. They have been cut off from their right to choose their beliefs as well as from their right to live safely and to decide their futures. Old people die at the shelter while newborns come into the world as refugees. Children leave for school from a place they can't call home. Home is a big room where limited family space is boarded off by blankets and sarongs. An emergency kitchen is shared, yet children still laugh and play around the yard of the building. It is a life of these Ahmadi people I tell in my novel, a fiction, but also a real life story. The Ahmadi and Lombok are only one example of the real life stories and injustices forgotten by our society in Indonesia and neglected by our government and state. The Ahmadi are not the only group of people in the world who have been persecuted in this way, discriminated against and killed on the basis of their faith. My first novel, Entrok, or Years of the Voiceless, was published in 2010. At the time, I was young and witnessing Indonesia 10 years after the fall of the totalitarian regime. The nation, despite being a democratic country, was still facing problems of injustice, corruption, poverty, violence, and discrimination. While the story is about Indonesia, it's also about democratic freedoms, about resisting military power, and saying no to control and censorship by our government, themes that resonate across the world. My second novel, 86, is about how corruption became a systematic problem in Indonesia. Isn't corruption also one of the biggest problems in the world now? 
Yet many of us still don't realize that corruption isn't about some people stealing money. More than that, it is a problem for humanity, which leads people to live under poverty, receive a poor education, and lack of health service. My third novel, Maryam, The Outcast, tells the story of an Islamic minority group that has undergone persecution, intolerance, and violence, and has been living in a refugee camp. Discrimination and intolerance are happening everywhere in the world. It's not just about Indonesia or Islam. My fourth novel, Pasung Jiwa, Bound uh, Gebunden, touches on LGBT issues in Indonesia. And my latest novel, Kerum uh, Munan Tarakir, The Last Crowd, looks at the problems technology presents to society. All of my novels talk about the condition of Indonesia, attempting to portray its people and condition from the previous regimes until the present day. While they are about certain people and about a nation in a certain part of the world, they reflect the stories of people all across the world trying to handle the pressing problems of our time. I've often, um, I've often been invited to talk about my novels, my society, Indonesia, and of course Islam. Some are legitimately curious about my works, while others are more curious about the writer, a Muslim woman who is able to criticize her society and religion. But I've never catered my writing to an international public or to publishers. In fact, I've never even given the local and universal much thought. Simply put, I write about what's important to society so the voiceless can be heard and the forgotten remembered. I believe the problems in Indonesia are globally shared. Because of this, we speak in one common tongue, humanity. So if the question is, should a writer speak on behalf of the universal, then I think there is something wrong with the question itself. The universal and local don't exist when we talk about humanity, human rights, consciousness, courage, and freedom. A problem in one country is a problem for the world, and so is its story. dazzling set of presentations and while my staff collects the questions I'm just going to alert you to some upcoming events and to tell you that if you want to read the presentations in uh, their entirety and uh, at a slower pace they're all always available on our website. Uh, this afternoon there's a special tribute to Dennis Johnson, the extraordinary poet, novelist, playwright, literary journalist who among other things, worked at the IWP for seven years. That will be at 4 o'clock in McBride Auditorium. Uh, our Shambaugh House reading, therefore, will start a half hour later this afternoon at 5.30. Uh, tomorrow at 4 o'clock in Space Place Theater in North Hall, there will be a special reading of Dennis Johnson's play, Psychos Never Dream. Uh, Sunday, we return to Prairie Lights for our Afternoon reading at 4 o'clock, Sunday night at Cinematheque. Uh, we'll be showing uh, Dilman Dillas will present his film, the Bro Her Broken Shadow, and Gada Al Absi from Egypt will present a short film, The Stone Cake, that's in the Adler Journalism Building, East, Room East 105. On Wednesday, if you're in Chicago, join us for events there. We have a reading at the Poetry Foundation. And we'll be back here next Friday for a panel on utopia and the future. Uh, we've got some good questions here, so let me just start with, uh, from Panache. Uh, you single out the West as the chief source of racism. Should, therefore, the East be a counterexample? Should I respond now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, could I ask, um, the, the, this is not to single out the person, but if, if it's appropriate to ask if they can elaborate, what do they mean by counterexample? Uh, can the writer elaborate? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, this, is a, this, is, this is how we smoke out who the real question This is not is. an intimidation tactic. I just would like to make sure I understand. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was wondering whether North and South would have been the proper opposition. But really, obviously, I was thinking about the fact that enlightenment, one of the Enlightenment's goal was to erase the, the distinctions between uh, kinds of 
persons, including race, including gender. That's at least the concept of enlightenment as it was would have been drafted in the 18th century during the French Revolution. Uh -huh. and, that, and, that it, and wars were fought over that definition. But I really was thinking more honestly about this East-West, whether that implies East. In other words, are there other philosophical traditions that you would have evoked? You evoked the Ubuntu and the Zulu version, but I was wondering whether the West therefore implied some other kind of other philosophical traditions that would have been more remedial or less burdened by the racism that you have pointed out in your paper. Okay. Um, I think there are a number of things I'll try to just um, tease out there. Um, I think we might have different points of departure because um, I would say m in my understanding of what enlightenment is as a sort of concept over the last 500 years in ordering the modern world, um, it is a, it's one that's very intent on difference. I would not say it's er interested in erasing difference. It's one that's very intent on categorization, public, private, man, woman, spirit, matter. Um, for me, that is how I, if I understand sort of what is at the core of Western philosophies, I, I would, being very reductive, it's say compartmental, comp compartmentalization is, or dichotomies is something that it's very intent um, on doing. Um, and throughout sort of, you know, um, in the writings when you're reading sort of Hegel, it's, he's, you know, the person speaks about master-slave dialectics and very keen on saying, you know, we have a history where these people do not have a history. So that oppositional logic is very central to, and I would, I would strongly disagree that it's not interested in difference, where it's, it, to me, it's very, um, so central to, and which is, uh, for example, why when it encounters the other, it almost goes into a malfunction, which is what I would call the, the original crisis of, of, of Western imagination is, what do we do with these people who do not fit into these binaries that um, we've created um, for how we, we are sort of now becoming to sort of um, organize uh, the world, um, which is why then, because we can't categorize you, you must be either not quite human, not all, let's say for example, black women historically are not quite man, not quite woman, you're something else, right? So you must therefore be non-human. Um, my practice, well, the way in which I approach it is from very local, so I do look specifically if the ultimate other has been the black African, I look at what are certain philosophical traditions, and even on the continent, there's so many others. You know, if you look at sort of um, West Africa, particularly Nigeria, Yoruba culture has a very different kind of way of thinking. They have sort of um, multiple deities, for example, which is not necessarily what we have um, in, in uh, South Africa, well, Southern Africa, which is more ancestor veneration. So um, it's to say that this is simply one counterpoint. It's, I'm very much open to the fact that there might be, they, well, there very well are going to be different ways of being and conceptualizing being in the East um, of very many of the, the um, sort of indigenous philosophies that have been erased through this expansionism of the West. Um, and I named the West because it has been the single most uh, powerful and organizing um, force within the last 500 years. We, of course, have a whole history that goes thousands of years back before that, but I do just mean that in this particular moment, which is the last 500 years, the West has had a sort of hegemonic um, uh, force in sort of organizing, controlling how it is that we think about what humanity is. So, for example, like we mentioned, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is after World War II, you know, I would say the wars of conquest that have been fought in the New World and in, in, in sort of in colonizing new territories, those are the first world wars that were happening, but we only then consider the world wars once it is this major war or these major wars, you sort of intra-Europe and that sort of thing. So anyway, I think, I don't know if that helps um, yeah. answer. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Fabulous. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else on the panel want to take that question on? <laughs> okay. So um, we'll go in a completely different direction then. To what extent should a writer be an ambassador for their own nation or culture? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just jump yeah. in, um, just to, to start the ball rolling, I suppose. Um, it's, it, that, it's an interesting question. I mean, that, this is, you know, when I entered the room and saw these um, nations written underneath each of our names, I thought, oh, 
uh, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, I certainly don't. Um, uh, well, I said earlier I was suspicious, suspicious of the notion of universality. I'm also suspicious of the notion of um, nationhood, and uh, so I think it's it's problematic <laughs> to say you know that um, a writer's role ought to be to speak for a nation. Um, certainly, in my case. Um, the um, Australian government, I feel at the moment, does not represent my views on all that much. Um, and uh, so, but I, I think um, I take, um, uh, take, take this back to Hajar's point before about the responsibility to speak, and um, Vipas also mentioned this. I think we do have a responsibility to speak, but this question of who we're representing or who we're speaking on behalf of has to be constantly. Um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, treated with care <laughs> uh, and, and, and reflected, reflected on, not just by us, but, but by our readers as well, I think. Mm. But uh, for me, I, I can't because I'm, I'm become a minority in our writers because both of the writers in Thailand um, seem to be quite support with this, uh, what happened in, in Thailand. It's pretty sad. So um, I cannot represent Thailand for that. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else? Tanashree, do you want to? I just spoke for quite a while. I think you can wait for <laughs> <laughs> We like to listen to you. Oh, really? Oh, OK. Um, I guess like, I think I just would, would take on what um, Julian has said about problematizing the nation. Um, the nation state, again, another sort of particular idea of the last 500 years, what is the nation state? And it is something that is very intent on policing who becomes a citizen and who is not a citizen. Um, and I mean, it's Anne McClintock says all nationalisms are dangerous. Um, or, all, nationalisms are, all nationalisms are invented. All nationalisms mm -hmm. are dangerous. Um, and all of them are gendered, right? And particularly the ways in which, you know, you can see right now in America right now, you can see what particular kinds of nationalisms means, how we have to police borders, borders of who fits in. Um, and there's the actual nation state, but nations, even let's say, um, nationalisms that, that, are, that are formed in response to colonizing nationalisms, anti-colonial nationalisms tend to also have very, um, negative consequences for those, particularly for women, colonized women and that kind of thing. So I think just problematizing the nation is, 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 a prob is something that we need to do. Um, and just thinking about um, speaking on behalf of people is something that I think we just need to think about a little bit more and the particular positionality, particularly most of us are very privileged in where we sit. Um, most, most writers in the world tend to be middle class people, people who have access to particular kinds of education. Um, if you had to ask people on the ground, which is also a very problematic term, um, <laughs> they might be very um, sort of have a very different perception of what the problems you profess to write about us. So I think that I don't think it's as easy as, sim as simply saying that you should speak for or on behalf of people who are silenced. You have to ask why are people silenced and, and, and sort of when you are speaking, are you aware that you might be silencing other people in your quest to save <laughs> these people? Um, I, I just think it's a little bit more nuanced than simply a right or um, a, a, a duty to 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 justice and in, in those in these particular um, frames. Hajar, mm -hmm. you want? <laughs> no, uh, I just uh, think that we we must not feel guilty of anything. Uh, yeah, but uh, we can be from the west, from the north, from the south, or every, uh, anywhere. We can be uh, uh, there. There can there can be a, a war in our country. And how how do we place ourselves? How how we are always gu guilty of something? Yes. <laughs> I'm going to follow up with we, we have a question here which is very intriguing. Why the emphasis on problems? What about joy? <laughs> Peter, did you want to answer? 
this was a Mondo. We had a writer named Joy there, yeah. Yeah. who brought joy, great joy to himself, but nobody else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, shade. No, 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 no. <laughs> and actually, the, the poet you're referring to had managed to find, an, he was from uh, Calcutta, he managed to find a, an Indian couple from Cedar Rapids who would drive down here every day to, to cook him a potato, Whoa. right? <laughs> That's all he could eat. <laughs> uh, I want to add, uh, I think it's because Tao Toy said in, uh, in Anna Kalinina, the, all the happiness is all the same. But the, the, yeah. if you remember that, you yeah. know, that quote, uh, that's why we prefer writing about problem. <laughs> <laughs> Every happy family is alike. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in your short time here, have you had any remarkable experiences related to your paper today? <laughs> so. <laughs> What's remarkable? Let's, let's define oh, remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's remarkable? You know, what, what, whatever is remarkable to you. OK, well, I know we've just been critiqued for, for our problematizing, but I guess I work in, in the academy, so we're supposed to problematize all the time. Um, and the reason why I'd actually chosen to put my name under the panel when I had not actually read the whole thing, um, when I said, you know, right, to speak for the universal, I was actually interested in a question of canon, um, sort of the universal canon is what I was interested in speaking to. Um, and I could say that very, I mean, I'm going to sort of throw a cat amongst the pigeons right now, but I, I find that I, fi I find myself quite troubled by the centering of a particular canon, the universal canon. Um, I, I expected to find different um, centers of, 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 of literature, of, you know, and, and I find myself sometimes annoyed when people reference their canon and expect me to know theirs in a way that I would never think to do. I would think about explaining, oh, do you know this and this writer or whatever, but I'm expected to know particular kinds of greats um, to show, to index that. I am valid, I am also part of a particular kind of universal, a particular kind of legitimate literati. Um, and I, I guess particularly it's, it's, it's troubling because most of us are not from the center. And so that continuous referencing, and, and so those at the margins continuing to reference the center as a form of legitimization is what I find I expect it from here, of course, because this is the center, a particular kind of center, but um, that's in terms of canon and the, the, the continual centering of the center is, is something that I find uh, frustrating. I suppose my, um, th the thing I find remarkable about being here in Iowa City um, is that um, America as a, an imagined concept is um, very dominant in our film and literature, not just in Australia, but right, right across the world, whether in English-speaking countries or not, I think. And it feels strange to be suddenly parachuted <laughs> inside <laughs> the imagined space. And um, I, I'm, unlike the other writers, I'm staying in a, uh, somebody's backyard in a very sweet little um, converted garage. But the neighbourhood I'm in is um, the America of the imagined storybook and I find it quite remarkable <laughs> to, that I'm walking around in it, that it smells, that it, it has colour, that it, uh, you know, that it, you can touch things. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sort of walking around trying to, re well I am I think constantly renegotiating um, what this place means as a people, as a nation, as a place and um, what's underneath the stories we've been presented, you know, all this time. And, and, and things like, you know, um, we were just talking the other day about, you know that scene in such and such a film, maybe that was ironic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, for me, uh, maybe... Um because Thailand is number three in the world of the uh, highest uh, inequality between rich and poor. So I feel that uh, when I saw, because I'm running a lot, running, jogging, I mean, um, 
so I saw a house without fences. Because in Thailand, it's, you cannot imagine that. In Bangkok, that people will reach and it's all fence and walls, <coughs> house, which, you know. But here, I didn't have it. So I feel quite impressed with it for that. Does anybody explain that for me? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Isn't America also one of the highest inequalities? I mean, I live in a country with no, one of the highest inequalities the as well. Thailand. South Africa is number one, I think. So. No, no, Russia. Oh, is it Russia? Yeah. Okay, well, we're, we're usually top yeah, We oscillate, it, it moves. <laughs> <laughs> it depends, it depends on the year. Yeah. At some point it has been. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think, uh, uh, we had an Irish playwright who said once, looking out at, uh, we were in the town of Hills at a barbecue and he said, this is so familiar to me from American films, but it's so different. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe <clears throat> what writers have to do is to get at that difference, right? Mm -hmm. But Hadra, you had something to say? Uh, yeah, I, I remember that Krishnamurti said, uh, uh, nous ego devant la nature. We are all equal. Yeah, we need all to, to laugh, to love, to, to, to eat, to and to smoke, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as, as a final question we have here, and, and anyone can take this, or all can take this, uh, could it be argued that all writing inherently speaks to the universal? Uh, the, the question is, could it be argued that all writing inherently speaks to the universal? Does all writing speak to the all? <laughs> let, let it be recorded that for once the writers were silent. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if I understood well, but for, uh, I th for me, writers, the, um, the novels, the, all, the, all the writings are, you know, have something uh, to, to, to do with universal, yeah. uh, uh, because they, they speak, the, uh, the, the good writers, I mean, the, those who, qui nous touch? Touch you. Touch us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, every... Uh, if not, they, if not, they, I cannot be touched by uh, by a writer who who is writing in South Africa or so, or in other country that I don't uh, don't I don't know the the, the history or something like that. Like that. Mm -hmm. There is something. There is a level where everybody can understand, which which linked with the nature, with it, linked with the, our nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Human, know. yeah. I don't know, I'm, I'm right, I'm not conscious about that, about universal, not universal. I think it's a, it's a really good writing or bad writing. And always good writing always, you know, have a, uh, ring some true in it, have a, mm -hmm. uh, that, have a simple human condition that everybody can understand. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really conscious about that. And if I write only about politics, it's turned into propaganda anyway. And if I write without politics, it's also become just decorous, decoration, mm -hmm. is it? Mm -hmm. Somebody said that before, yeah. So I think it's just only good and bad writing for mm. me. Yeah, mm. yeah uh, uh, what he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the essay, essay I'm thinking of is Eduardo um, Glissant's essay, um, The Right to Opacity, um, which is a really brilliant essay that, and he speaks about, uh, and if we're, I think you were here talking about different kinds of his book, it's from the book of essays, Poetics of Relation, right? If I'm, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And speaking about a different way of being, so people who are thinking how differently can we exist um, and relate to, to people. And this, the right to opacity specifically, it speaks to the demand for the other to be legible and understandable. Um, and what I mean by that, um, because to give a very practical example, I'll give you two. One, for those of us who are not on the center, um, when I write very specifically about my context, about my locality, and I use the words or references that are specific to me, 
what often mean that often if I have a local editor, they might be like, mm, please take out certain terms or whatever. It's, it's a little bit too specific, right? Um, or if I have, let's say, a US editor, they'll want to have me explain everything, um, have me always put in explanations in ways that, and, and many writers have problematized this glossing. I mean, there's, a, there's an essay right now, a New York uh, review of books by, um, uh, Namwali Sope, who speaks about African writers and having to consistently gloss in a way that we have never been glossed for. When I have to read America, everyone expects that I understand your references, but when I do it, I must always give you a glossary of this means one, two, one, two, three, and you don't develop the faculties of inference and, and that kind of um, thing. Um, so I think it's not a neutral thing when you talk about universality, because usually that means a homogenizing effect for those of us who are not in those universal or the, the great literatures or the great languages of, of, of the world. Um, and so and, and maybe another pop culture example that, that I would use as a, if I was teaching that essay uh, would be Rihanna had a song recently called Work. And in it, she says, at some point, she goes, where, 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 where? And then she's, I'm not going to sing the whole song for you, but she <laughs> sings in, in, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Patois, for example. Mm -hmm. And so many reviewers, American, particularly white American reviewers, were like, oh, Rihanna speaks gibberish, right, That in, in, in her song, right? They dismissed it as gibberish. And people were like, no, just because you don't understand does not mean it's gibberish. This is very specific to her culture. It's just that you think that if it's not legible to you, it must therefore be gibberish. And so this inability to conceive of difference, if you do not understand it, it must be illegitimate, is sort of the way in which I think about the right to opacity, that you don't have to understand or I don't have to be legible to you in your terms in order for me to be legitimate. The song doesn't need to be legitimate. I mean, and then there were many songwriters from America who then post videos on YouTube say, I corrected Rihanna's song for you. This is the correct version, which is a really good example about the homogenizing effect of this is how we make Rihanna's song universal, mm -hmm. if you now understand it according to our standard. So I guess that's why I have difficulty with the idea of, of universality, because it tends to be a particular kind of homogenizing or marginalizing um, kind of discourse that means many of us cannot be who we are. I'm, I'm universal in as far as I measure up to a particular standard of what humanity or particular standard of what literature um, is. Um, and so then ultimately, I'd say, of course, everybody can speak for the universal in as far as you're writing about yourself because you represent the universe. But if we're analyzing what the universal has come to mean, then probably most of us do not fit in that idea of what um, the universal is. So yeah, that's my long answer to that. That's a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much for this. <laughs>